My division in the Department of Industry, Innovation and Science um, covers a number of things that I think will be of interest to you. Whole of government science policy, including supporting advisory bodies like the Commonwealth Science Council and Innovation and Science Australia. Governance and project work for science agencies um, in the portfolio but outside the department like CSIRO, AIMS, ANSTO, but also um, agencies that sit within the department um, like the National Measurement Institute. Uh, we do commercialisation policy work, including on intellectual property policy issues, working very closely with your next speaker, Patricia Kelly. Um, we look after Australia's international science and research relationships, including our bilateral funding programs with China and India, um, and the new collaboration programs introduced under the Innovation and Science Agenda. And finally, we work very closely with the Department of Education and Training on research infrastructure policy and program matters. I've got two science policy people in the room, so I feel I do need to point them out to you so that you can crash tackle them in the break. <laughs> Jessica, do you want to wave at me? There you are. And Rob, where are you? There you are. Um, and we also have Amber Beavis in the room, I noticed, from the Office of the Chief Scientist. I think it's useful to point them out to you because at a forum about um, science meeting policy makers, it might be an idea if you were to introduce yourself to a few policy makers. Um, we also share a floor, as um, Amber's presence would indicate, and work very closely with Dr Alan Finkel, the Chief Scientist, and his office. A big part of my division's work, along with providing strategic policy advice, is overseeing many of the initiatives under the National Innovation and Science Agenda. I sat down and worked it out that we had a third of what is a whole-of-government policy agenda to deliver through my division. That it covers initiatives like the Global Innovation Strategy that I mentioned earlier, our science engagement programs under the Inspiring Australia banner, working very closely with Questacon. Where are you, Graham? There you are. And the Innovation Connections program in the Entrepreneurs program. The agenda, as you probably know, provided just over a billion in measures over four years, but that's only one part of the government's investment in science and research. The government is investing more than 10 billion in R&D this financial year. It includes funding for business R&D, research in universities, research in government agencies such as CSIRO and Defence Science and Technology Group and cooperative and multi-sector research including medical research institutes. The total level of government investment in science and research and innovation is actually higher than that um, since non-R&D innovation is not included. So that means things like STEM education programs, parts of the entrepreneurs program and work undertaken through the industry growth centres isn't counted. When we consider um, the programs I just mentioned, um, along with the R&D tax incentive, CSIRO, other research agencies, a significant proportion of the government's investment flows through the industry innovation and science portfolio. But equally, a substantial proportion of the government's science and research activity happens in other portfolios of government. And a few of them will be pretty obvious, in health especially, and not surprisingly, um, also through the education and training portfolio, not surprisingly, with their responsibility for research policy and funding but also in defence, environment, agriculture, and I could go on. What that means more than anything is whether you're talking about science, agricultural, environmental, health, medical, social, or many other policy responses, it's obviously important to have effective coordination across different portfolios and across government as a whole. And that is perhaps the most critical role of my division, developing policies for and providing advice to government that takes a whole of system or as Ian Chubb would have said, a whole of STEM pipeline perspective. From getting more Australians interested in science, seeing them study it at school and university, supporting pursuit of science and encouraging collaboration with industry domestically and globally. Now to do this, we work with the chief scientist and the advisory bodies I mentioned, the Science Council and the, and the Innovation and Science Australia Board. But we also partner with many others. We partner with other Australian government departments and agencies. Um, we partner with stakeholders and representative bodies like the academies and Science and Technology Australia, including, I might add, in designing and delivering initiatives. And we also try to take or create opportunities to meet directly with scientists and researchers. It might be through formal consultation processes associated with particular activities or less formal activities, like forums like today or more direct personal contacts. And that's all about understanding the view at the coalface. Now just hold that thought. I'm very pleased to say that our efforts to progress a co coordinated whole of government approach to science and science policy is informed by a published science policy, the National Science Statement, released in March this year, 
and itself a significant <coughs> policy outcome. I'm quoting from it when I say that the National <coughs> Science Statement sets a long-term approach to science, providing guidance for government investment and decision-making, and clarity on strategic aims. It sets out a vision for an Australian society engaged in and enriched by science with four objectives. Those four objectives, engaging all Australians with science through initiatives like National Science Week, but also supporting and encouraging high quality, interesting and relatable science education. Building our scientific capability and skills in the research sector and in the workforce. Producing new research, knowledge and technologies through high quality world leading research across Australia and improving and enriching Australians' lives through science and research, be that by increased productivity, growing high skill, high wage jobs, driving improved social, economic, health and environmental outcomes for all in our region and in the world. The National Science Statement you'll find on science.gov.au and it's about aspirations and goals. It's intended to inform discussions about funding and ensure that public investment in science leads to measurable outcomes and benefits. It is guiding right now how we develop new policies and programs and how we approach the core role of my division, providing well-informed and timely advice to government. The statement recognises that the government will seek advice from experts in informing policy development. However, those outside government and the public service might say that policy and program development seems like a black box. At its worst, subject to short-term thinking and political whim, never providing enough funding, never placing a high enough priority on insert your specialisation here. <laughs> the truth is the policy process is a lot like the scientific method and that's not gratuitous. Both rely on evidence, on the testing of hypothesis, evaluation of outcomes and publication of results. They both happen largely out of the public eye and they can seem happenstance to the uninitiated. A few years ago, the Public Service Commission convened a group of leaders from across the APS and tasked them with looking at positioning the public service to perform its role. That group was called the APS 200 and it produced reports and strategies on diversity, on the ageing workforce, on public sector innovation and, are you ready, in 2012, the place of science in policy development. The final report from that particular project is also available on science.gov.au. It included this diagram of the policy process. <coughs> I think you'll agree the diagram looks like some standard representations of the scientific method. And there's a growing appreciation, I have to say, of the value <coughs> science and scientists bring at each step in this process, regardless of what government portfolio we're talking about. That value is expressed in gathering and analysing information, in testing ideas and options informally or via consultations, in informing decisions and assisting with implementation, in assessing the impact and effectiveness of policies and in identifying emerging issues and opportunities. So accepting that one can overcome the challenges in policy making by engaging with the right people and the right evidence at the right time, it's a no-brainer to put aside any sense of cultural difference between scientists and policy makers and to seek to engage very directly with scientists and their representative bodies but you might expect the Head of Science and Commercialisation Policy Division to say that. <laughs> there are more than a few scientists working in many areas of government other than our own, but we continue to consider, including through mechanisms like the National Science, Technology and Research Committee and the Secretary's Board, where and how we might build on that. I don't think I'm going too far out of school to say that the Office of the Chief Scientist is a particular champion in this space, so watch that space. I'd like to finish off by talking briefly about a couple of recent policy wins that show, I think, how the policy process can work in one corner of the public service and, more pertinently, how um, they tell to working to the aspiration of the statement in seeking expert advice and engaging scientists in the process. <coughs> First up, the Australian synchrotron. I know there are some people in this room that are bored to hear me talk about the synchrotron, but I can't stop talking about it. A critical piece of research infrastructure that has enabled groundbreaking basic and applied research in a wide range of fields, including health, advanced materials, manufacturing, security and climate change. Unfortunately, it was built and launched without any long-term sustainable basis for funding its use or maintenance, never mind expansion. 
and with a governance structure that delivered initial funding but was not well suited to dealing with any of those issues. As of 1 July last year, however, we secured both reliable long-term funding, $520 million over the 10 years to 2025-26, and more stable and sustainable governance, governance arrangements. Now, key to that decision was the appreciation of the impact and potential impact of the synchrotron across every sector of the economy. And a business case constructed through a working partnership between my division and the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation with the active assistance of 13 consortia, each consisting of multiple research and government institutions across the country and into New Zealand. My second, more recent example is the new agreement signed by Minister Sinodinos a few weeks ago that secured eight metre access for Australian optical astronomers through a strategic partnership with the European Southern Observatory. And Lisa, this picture's for you. This was the culmination of years of patient work by scientists and policy makers in Australia and internationally and the breakthrough came when we in government listened to the researchers and their aspirations and when government and the science community worked hand in hand. Both the synchrotron and the ESO winds are examples of the kind of work that goes on behind the scenes, perhaps only known to those with a direct stake in the outcome. Both are the result of patient discussions between agencies, sometimes with state governments, international governments, peak bodies and consortia. Um, it goes on all the time. It doesn't often involve substantial funding, these examples notwithstanding, and it rarely makes the evening news. The key feature in these two examples, and others, is the importance of a keen focus on the benefits for the sector, the community and the nation and the value of partnerships to ensure the policy design is well-tuned, but also because sometimes the government simply can't do it alone. So it's important to acknowledge that a lot of good policy work, certainly science policy work, can only happen with the assistance, advice and support of partners like STA, the academies, universities, individual academics, discipline-based groups and institutions, and on-the-ground researchers like many of you here today. Thank you to those of you that we've worked with to date. Hello to future partners in crime, sorry, I mean science policy. <laughs>